Welcome to Case Flash, brought to you by the Connecticut Bar Association. I'm Sam Schoonmaker. Today's Case Flash addresses uh, clarification of judgments and the Supreme Court's decision in Bauer v. Bauer. First, the basic facts of the case. This marital dis dissolution case was tried in 2005. The trial court rendered a memorandum of decision uh, that stated, among its findings of fact, that the parties agreed to split equally the defendant's pension accounts. The court went on to issue 12 orders pertaining to alimony, property division, and insurance. Uh, however, there was no specific orders dividing the pensions. The memorandum of decision was incorporated by reference into the judgment. Neither party filed a motion to re-argue or a motion for reconsideration, and neither party uh, appealed. Three years later, the plaintiff filed a motion for contempt uh, on multiple issues, um, including on alimony and, and, uh, and on the pensions. Uh, the defendant objected on the pensions, saying that there was no order for division of the pensions. So the uh, plaintiff then filed a motion for clarification asking the trial court to reconfirm his previous order and equally divide the pensions by quadro. The defendant opposed clarification, arguing that there was no order to clarify. He contended that what uh, the plaintiff was seeking was a post-judgment property order, which is precluded under 46B81. The trial court agreed with the plaintiff, uh, divided the pensions equally, and uh, ordered a quadro. The appellate court reversed the trial court. It reasoned that although the trial court may have intended to divide the pensions equally, it did not do that. Uh, there was no order to clarify. The trial court impermissibly modified the judgment. Uh, that is, the defendant was not ordered to divide the pensions at the time of the uh, divorce, and three years later he couldn't be ordered to divide the pensions. Uh, the Supreme Court reversed the appellate court. The trial court it determined had properly clarified its judgment and did not modify it. The matter was remanded with direction to affirm the trial court. Mm -hmm. Judge Gordon, what is it that gets incorporated into a, a judgment? Well, I think that most trial judges would have been really surprised at the appellate court's decision that the only thing that was part of the judgment subject to clarification were the orders, because I think that most of us, when we write a decision, think that everything that we're writing is our judgment. And part of that is our factual findings, and part of it are the orders that follow the factual findings. And 99% of all motions for clarification that we get have to do with some inconsistency or ambiguity between the two of those portions of the um, uh, judgment. And uh, I was kind of baffled by the uh, appellate court's approach, because often uh, what we are asked to clarify is in fact the absence of an order that looks like it's coming based on the absolutely clear factual findings we're making and we may have made a mistake and left it off. Um, and it gives us the opportunity to correct that mistake. Under the appellate court we wouldn't have been able to do that because it wasn't in order. Uh, Attorney Palmer, the appellate court did kind of demarcate between uh, the factual findings and the orders. Did that demarcation make sense to you the way they had done it? As, as a practicing family lawyer, absolutely. Um, when we uh, receive a memorandum of decision, uh, the facts are important, the facts are always important, but what we advise our clients on is their compliance with the orders that were entered. So this all came up because of a motion for contempt uh, on the, uh, the 2005 decision. Could he have been found uh, in violation of the 2005 decision and willful contempt of the implicit order that the pension be divided? I don't believe so because in order to be found in contempt, the judges always uh, analogize it to the three-pronged stool. And one of the things you have to have in the three-pronged stool is a clear unequivocal court order. And if there was no order directing him to transfer the pension, I don't know how he could be held in contempt for something that didn't exist. Well, if I can just jump in, when we incorporate agreements, written agreements, we incorporate them by reference and make them part of our decree. And we hold people in contempt all the time for violating the terms of that decree, even though there aren't separate orders written. And she did accept their agreement. She accepted their agreement by incorporating it, in by writing it in her memorandum of decision and then incorporating that 
as part of the decree? How does it differ from incorporating an agreement? You don't have orders, you just have a decree. Um, I think, though, when you enter a, a decree based on a separation agreement, the language of a separation agreement is written in such a manner that husband shall do X, Y, and Z, wife shall do A, B, and C. So by incorporating it, it is, in effect, being written as a court order. That wasn't done here. All that was done here is, is that there's some acknowledgement that the parties had some understanding as to the pension without the court ever articulating in its original memorandum of the decision what that understanding was. But the transcript's clear that they stipulated on the record, his lawyer stipulated on the record that they were going to equally divide the pension. But the trial court had no obligation to necessarily follow that. No, it didn't, but it did. Well, we don't have any obligation to incorporate anybody's separation agreement or approve it either, but she did. And so once it's there, I, I, I think that the entire separation of these two parts is completely uh, uh, I don't understand it. There's no citation for it, there's no authority for it, and it doesn't make any sense. And so I think that the Supreme Court basically got it right and said a decision has uh, is complex, um, it has different parts, it's all the decision, it's all the decree, and motions to clarify are essentially used when there's an ambiguity, and there's often ambiguities between the factual findings and the order. The other thing I, I thought that was significant is that both parties um, request that the pension be divided equally assume their perspective as to what the mosaic on dividing the finances should look like. And my, my problem with the way this all came down three years after the fact is that the husband, had this been done 20 days or within 20 days of the original judgment or within four months of the original judgment, the husband could have had an opportunity to appeal and say, this, this judgment is in error. Is, is your concern about the next case, the case where it's not as clear, that there's no stipulation, it's just maybe both parties ask for the same thing in their claims for relief, well, and, and then the court, uh, it's four months, four years later, uh, orders it? Well, that, that's exactly it, because it, it had, had the order, instead of the order being read that the parties had an agreement that the pension be divided equally, the trial court said, both parties have requested that the trial court divide the husband's pension equally. Okay, now we're four years down the road, and the judge is trying to remember what the intention was at the time the memor memorandum of decision was written. And in that case, it's a flip of the coin. You know, any anything might have happened between the original case and the and the article or the clarification years later to make a judge, you know, enter an order that might not have been entered. So, Judge, where's the line now between a articulation and a modification? How do you know when it's proper to articulate and when you're overreaching and modifying? Well, I think that if you're clarifying, you best be sure that there's something that's unclear or ambiguous. Um, and if it's perfectly obvious and doesn't seem unclear, you're modifying. If there's three levels to this case. There were some irregularities at the trial court level from the way things are normally done. And then the appellate court kind of jumped in and created something that didn't exist before. And the Supreme Court just went back to the way things have always done, have always been done. I don't think that this breaks any new ground in the Supreme Court level. Actually, sitting as a trial judge, I can tell you that I'm not sure we could have more requests for clarification, articulation, or anything else than we already have after we issue a memorandum of decision. They're used all the time. They're used as argument to set up appeals. They're used to articulate when you really shouldn't be articulating. And um, I think if they're used appropriately, we should welcome requests for clarification because if we're not clear, our point is to make our orders or our decisions or our thoughts clear so that people will stay out of court and um, be able to get on with their lives. So I welcome them. I, I, or I would have welcomed them if I was still on the bench. It's not like there's no order. There's, a, there's a, uh, a finding that there was an agreement. And then the court goes on from there to find, to issue 12 more orders. If you were the uh, trial counsel, couldn't you have read it that way? That the court has already found that there's an agreement, that there's a stipulation. Then the court run, goes on to enter 12 more orders. I mean, how can you fault the, the, uh, the trial counsel just because the agreement wasn't in the order section. Until this case came down, though, I don't know of any other case that stands for that proposition. I, th I think that after, after the Bauer case is handed down, I, I agree with you. 
I think we now read it as an, an integrated document the same way we've read separation agreements, the same way we've interpreted judgments forever. Um, so I, I agree that uh, at this point, you know, we have to look at the findings of fact and see if there are any quote-unquote hidden orders in there that, wasn't, that weren't translated into the order section. I have a completely different view of that. I think we don't have any cases on this because it was as obvious as the nose on all of our faces, and it barely passes the straight face test to stand up and say there's, to say that there's two parts of a, of a decision and something that's incorporated by reference isn't part of your decree and doesn't have the effect of, of, of an order. So, um, you know, sometimes we don't have appellate cases uh, t directing us to things because it's obvious. So I don't think that the absence of a case, you know, I can just tell you as a trial judge, it would have never crossed my mind that the only part of my decree was just the orders. However, how, how many times have you seen a litigant try to enforce a finding of fact? which is essentially what they're doing here. They're enforcing a finding of fact. They're not enforcing any orders. No, they asked for a clarification in order to make sure that there was... But the, initial, but the, initial, <laughs> but the initial motion was a motion for contempt to enforce a finding of fact. Right, that right. gets us back so to Sam's... So you're going to see more motions for contempt to enforce findings of fact is your, is your, is your concern. Yes. People are going to elevate mm -hmm. findings of fact into orders. I think that's what you're concerned that, That's is. exactly what my concern Well, is. but most findings of fact don't have a... Um, and this wasn't exactly a finding of fact. It was a statement of the party stipulation. So it was included in the findings of fact, but it was, wasn't really a finding of fact. And most findings of fact don't have an, have an order component to them. They don't, they don't have a compulsion to them. They're just descriptive. Right. So I yeah, think this, this is, is much unusual. Ado, is right. this just yeah. an anomaly then? Because they're, they're, she's reciting a st I do think it's an anomaly. She's reciting a stipulation. Time will tell whether the Bauer decision actually is significant or not, whether it changes the way people handle motions for clarification. Thank you for joining us today for Case Flash.